So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the use of multi-rod constructs in cervical spine reconstructions, which is something I've started doing uh, relatively recently. Uh, these are my conflicts, and I think none of them apply to the cases I'll be showing. Uh, so we know that rod fracture remains a very significant concern and, and uh, is a hallmark of a non-union or pseudoarthrosis following uh, multi-segment fusions in uh, adult spinal deformity in the thoracolumbar uh, spine, and there are a number of uh, articles demonstrating a fairly high rate of that, uh, including the one by Justin Smith in the ISSG, which shows 9% uh, overall and a 22% rate of rod fractures around PSOs. I think a number of us have changed our approaches based on the recognition that this is a significant issue, uh, and I, I think we've developed a number of surgical options uh, to try to reduce the risk of rod fracture and increase the rate of solid fusion in these multi-segment uh, constructs. And mostly uh, that involves um, uh, bigger rods, multiple rods, and uh, maybe stiffer materials. Uh, this is an example that I recently revised of my own, a uh, woman that I took care of about four years ago here. And uh, this was her post-operative uh, x-ray. And at that time, I was using a three-rod construct spanning the um, spanning from just below the S1 pedicle screw up to the uh, thoracolumbar junction, covering all levels of uh, lumbar spine and uh, any level that we laminectomized. Unfortunately, this lady, despite uh, a, a, a nice early result, uh, came in at about three years uh, with a, a fracture of all three of her rods, and we actually saw this happen sequentially. So uh, she fractured one, uh, then a second, and finally the third rod. And you can see that she's now lost her uh, coronal plane uh, correction and is decompensated again uh, to her left uh, and, and somewhat anteriorly as well, and is retroverting her pelvis a bit. Um, and you can see on the right, the pseudoarthrosis clearly is present at the L3-4 disc space. The 4-5 and 5-1 discs uh, do seem to have healed solidly, uh, as well as the posterior column of every other level. So uh, I guess about three weeks ago or four weeks ago now, we revised her with a construct that is more my current go-to construct for thoracolumbar reconstructions using now a four-rod technique. Uh, this is a little different because I, I, I was dominoing on to the, the rods that were already in place rather than, um, rather than laying entirely new rods. But the a dual pelvic screw fixation with the uh, outrigger rods uh, attaching typically to dual head screws now and also some uh, inline and offset uh, connectors in, in her case. Uh, and she so far has, has done nicely from that. We did the re a revision of the 3-4 interspace by a, uh, a, a, an anterior to psoas approach uh, with a cage placement there. And uh, she's so far so good. It's obviously very early in that uh, reconstruction. So uh, really, is the solution bigger, better, more? Uh, Perhaps, I don't know. We've lost uh, Zach Tatter in here. I guess I can ask Jerry, since you're uh, looking a, a little uh, distracted there. What, what is the animal in, featured in that slide, Jerry, do you know? Oh, very good, woolly mammoth. Exactly. Used to used to frequent these uh, this region and uh, now uh, extinct ten thousand years. Massive, massive animal. So bigger, better, more. We can increase the rod diameter. That's been done. Almost all of us now, I think, are using six zero six three five rods for these reconstructions. Uh, we can increase rod stiffness. Uh, the um, uh, you know cobalt chrome rods certainly do that, uh, uh, and I think there will be uh, there certainly will be uh, more options uh, coming available um, uh, with the different alloys that are going to provide even stronger uh, and stiffer rods. And we can increase the rod number. So that's really the, the reflex that I think many of us have been following in thoracolumbar uh, spine. So the question becomes, is what's good for the goose good for the gander? Uh, now, I will acknowledge cervical spine reconstructions, the rate of nonunions when we do it posteriorly or anterior posteriorly is, is much lower than in the, th the, the, the thoracic and thoracolumbar spines. But uh, it is still a concern in certain settings. And I'll identify the ones I think are most uh, 
susceptible to this. So occipital cervical fusions, I think, are, are one region. Uh, patients that have undergone three-column reconstructions with a front and back uh, procedure are somewhat higher risk. And then cervical thoracic junction is, is the third area that I think provides uh, some risk. And I've seen non-unions in all three of these uh, clinical contexts. I will say uh, this is a uh, topic that uh, ISSG has attempted to look into, uh, and Peter can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, really there's just almost no uh, rod fractures in our current uh, database, and we're really unable to make uh, any strong conclusions about risk factors or clinical effects. But then to continue on, I'll just give a few clinical examples, and I think we really haven't standardized uh, the constructs uh, that we're going to be using here, and certainly I haven't. Uh, so th these are just some cases uh, that show uh, my recent approaches in a, in a variety of clinical situations. So this woman uh, was uh, operated on now 11 years ago by another surgeon for, uh, for subaxial spinal stenosis and myelopathy, but you can see that she has uh, a non-union of the dens uh, between behind C1 there 10 years ago, that wasn't a clinical problem for her. Uh, but uh, more recently, she came in to see me, and despite the successful treatment of the subaxial problem, she now has displaced the C1-C2 uh, junction and really is, is pinching the uh, spinal cord at the C1 level uh, with, uh, with a really profound myelopathy uh, involving both upper and lower extremities, as you'd expect. Uh, and here's her CAT scan showing uh, similar uh, issues in the displacement. This was an old uh, C1 ring and C2 fracture she uh, had as a young woman uh, following a fall that was treated in a halo non-operatively uh, and clearly didn't heal but was stable for her for many years. Uh, but uh, this is a, obviously an adverse natural history to that non-union that uh, uh, developed in her case. Uh, and I felt this needed an occipital cervical uh, fusion given the extent of the degenerative disease and the presence of the fusion subaxially. Uh, we agreed to continue the fusion down into the upper thoracic spine. And uh, what I used here was outrigger rods uh, from the thoracic pedicle screws, which were placed with sort of an in out in technique uh, to put them more laterally. Uh, and then dominoes above the uh, C2 screws. Uh, to uh, complete the construct. Uh, and one of the things I have started doing is uh, offsetting the uh, upper thoracic screws in order to allow uh, easy access to the uh, rod, uh, the auxiliary rods uh, that were placed here. Um, I think that actually accentuates the typical placement. The, in my hands, the typical location of the T1 and T2 screws is already lateral to the cervical construct, and it's always required a little bit of a rod bend, typically. Uh, to uh, to anchor the rod into those screws. So uh, in this case, rather than bending the primary rod, we're, uh, we're dominoing around it and using those screws as a primary source of fixation. Here's a second uh, case. Uh, this is a, um, a recent uh, call case, a gentleman who, very uh, pleasant and interesting uh, man, interesting life history that I won't go into completely, but had been treated uh, for cervical disguidus with an uh, extended IV antibiotic course uh, elsewhere, uh, which unfortunately did not lead to uh, resolution of his symptoms. It did re uh, resolve the infection, uh, but you can see that he's collapsed through the uh, C67 vertebral bodies, and similar to what um, uh, Amir was talking about, this is a case where uh, the integrity of the vertebral bodies warrants a corpectomy, uh, as well as the presence of compression posteriorly behind uh, the vertebral bodies. So we went in with a plan to do this as an anterior and posterior operation with a possibility that we would do a third stage anterior uh, to place the, the graft after corpectomy and, and posterior uh, realignment and fusion. We actually were able to get the correction through just an anterior approach, uh, and I think because the deformity had not been there for really a, a substantially long time, the um, the stiffness was was not uh, not difficult, and we were able to uh, to extend the neck uh, interoperatively following a corpectomy. Uh, and here again, similar to the prior case, uh, we're, I'm using. Um, uh, an offset position with an in-out-in technique for the thoracic screws and then running a 5-5 rod up and dominoing to uh, the 4-0 uh, um, primary cervical construct. 
And then uh, finally, uh, this is a third case uh, uh, intended to show the issues at the cervical thoracic junction. Uh, this is a 52-year-old man who came to me with a, a known history of upper thoracic uh, idiopathic scoliosis uh, that had never been treated surgically, uh, and uh, he had um, congenital stenosis of the cervical spine, and now with the, the extended degeneration in the cervical spine, it developed uh, significant cervical myelopathy. Uh, you can see his overall alignment on his long films, uh, and you can see that his shoulders are out of uh, horizontal balance, and his cervical spine is quite kyphotic, perhaps as a result of trying to relieve the uh, cord compression, uh, perhaps as a result of the degenerative uh, de uh, changes. But uh, again, similar to what uh, Chris uh, Chris Shaffrey was talking about. The primary deformity here includes kyphosis, but really this is an unusual case in that he does include a coronal, he does have a significant coronal uh, deformity of the cervical spine. And, and this shows the significant cord compression at the three worst levels of stenosis. So this was a case I wanted to be careful not to throw out of alignment, and so we elected to go posteriorly here first because I wasn't sure how much correction I would get of the idiopathic curve, and I wanted to make sure that if I didn't fully correct the idiopathic curve that I could leave a little curve in the cervical spine to balance it so we wouldn't uh, throw his head out of alignment. And I think we were pretty, pretty well uh, accomplished that. You can see that his... Um, his shoulders are in better balance, and uh, and we've got the coronal and sagittal alignment uh, fairly well restored. Uh, and here, I used a primary rod that was a dual diameter rod extending from C2 to T7, and then placed an outrigger rod, again using uh, dominoes and using the T1 and T2 pedicle screws uh, as anchor points for uh, for an outrigger rod. And, and, and again, he's very early in his recovery, and uh, again, I'm just throwing out some ideas about uh, how we might approach approach this uh, and uh, use modular implants in order to accomplish uh, stronger constructs. And th these are what his uh, long films uh, looked like uh, postoperatively. And again, you can see that his shoulders are in much better alignment and overall balance. Maybe not perfect, but I think, uh, I think he may uh, yet have um, come through uh, just a postural change in the uh, lower thoracic levels to balance out the coronal plane. So in conclusion, I think rod fracture is a concern in some cervical settings, uh, and I've tried to point out the ones that I think are most prone to that. Uh, I think our implant strategies are changing uh, uh, in similar ways to how they've changed in thoracolumbar uh, spine in the last several years. Uh, but for me, I've not yet standardized uh, an approach here, and I'm really uh, just showing some, uh, you know, first first efforts and and uh, first ideas and how we might approach this. I think we will see improvements in modularity and connectivity, perhaps uh, dual head screws uh, in the cervical spine, uh, as well as uh, better and more facile offset connectors. And uh, uh, ultimately, uh, this, I think, reflects the strength of the materials we have. Uh, but I think we will we'll be seeing devices with increased material strength uh, that may ultimately reverse these trends. And uh, I'd like to close with this photo. This is my son uh, 10 years ago at the 2011 World Series, the last series at least to date, that the St. Louis Cardinals won. Uh, that's him with my brother on his on his left uh, in the middle picture and with my mom behind him. Uh, and I show this because this week uh, he was up here in Seattle. He's going to start as a freshman at University of Washington. He's 18 now, and he's taller than me, and his voice is deeper than mine. So uh, it's nice to look back on a uh, happy memory with him. Thanks so much. That was an excellent talk and a great slide at the end. Can't believe how how, bit, how he's going to college. The um, I have a qu question. I think it's an interesting point. I think it's a definitely a different dynamic than thoracolumbar uh, spinal deformity surgery, um, where we see very high rates, and we don't, we're not seeing that in the cervical spine. And I think it's because we're seeing high rates of junctional failure, uh, and the the low to failure threshold is is so so much higher um, as opposed to the load to failure for uh, developing a sacral fracture or, or a pelvic fracture uh, distal to the construct or distal to the osteotomy is much greater. Uh, but I think with, with further um, follow-up, we will see some, especially in uh, patients, which we have increasing in our series of 
essentially total spine fusions. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a great point. So, uh, so I, I hadn't thought of that, but I think that that makes a great deal of mechanical sense. Um, it's interesting you say that, and, and you're right. I mean, it, the uh, the analogous problem to proximal junctional failure that we saw in the high rates in the thoracolumbar junction uh, or thoracolumbar patients, we're seeing a, the analogous distal junctional failures in the cervical and cervical thoracic reconstructions. Right. I think that's what you're referring to. So they do fail there. There, and maybe that decreases the ultimate uh, load on the on the construct, uh, or or at least just the just from the get go, the original setup. I guess uh, I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're exactly right. And that may also uh, be why. I mean, I think one of the uh, one of the locations where I've seen it in, in a patient or two of my own is at occipital cervical junction, where you it's not quite the same loads, but we also don't have quite the same diameter and stiffness of material to work with right now, so yeah, great comment. Andrew? Yeah, excellent talk, uh, very forward thinking. Wanted to ask, uh, I've often difficult to uh, bone graft with, uh, in, in, um, you know, with, with four rods or even three rods, and so would you mind speaking to your order of orthodesis, your techniques, you know, as you put in the rods? Um, do you put in all the rods first, then decorticate, then bone graft, or are you putting in half the rods? When you do your quaternary constructs? So I lay my fourth rods lateral. So I, t I focus my fusion material on the midline, so in the facet joints. So, so my fourth rods, my third and fourth rods don't really obstruct my access to where I'm working to get fusion uh, in a posterior setting. I know um, uh, Chris Ames, I think, puts his outrigger rods medially. Uh, I, I hope I'm getting that right. And, and I think there's a mechanical argument for that, that it actually is a better mechanical construct to do them medially as opposed to lateral. So that might, uh, in that case, affect it. But uh, my sequence uh, in the OR is screws, primary rods, get the correction, outrigger rods are the are the next, and then um, and then decortication and fusion, and you know obviously w whatever decompression or uh, osteotomies need to be done in between. So. Yeah, personally, I've put the, the, the rods in last, the fourth, third, fourth rod in last, whether it's cervical thoracic junction or thoracic lumbar, you know, on top of the, basically putting the bone graft down and laying the rods and you know, push it, push it down. Yeah. That's just my preference. Yeah. No, I think that it's a good technical point and makes makes sense. Yeah. I, I agree. And I do the same in, for the third and fourth rod. And, and also for the connectors, I put them high so they're not at the facet so you can get adequate grafting. Right. Andrew Jack. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, just going back to what you and Dr. Passius were talking about there with respect to junctional failure, I, I know that you're a big proponent of tethers in that for thoracolumbar lumbar deformity in PJK or PJF. Can you talk a little bit about the techniques that you use to prevent DJF? Yeah. So for me, very similar. So uh, I, years ago, was a proponent of um, uh, adjacent segment uh, vertebroplasty. And I eventually standardized that to being usually the UIV plus one and the UIV, so the less instrumented level and then the level immediately above. Uh, but I felt that I found a higher rate of rapid degeneration. So even though it prevented fractures, it was effective at that. Uh, it did not prevent, and I thought maybe accelerated, uh, degeneration of the adjacent disc. And I, I think that might relate to the mechanical setting that you've now created, not just the stiffness of the rods, but the, the increased uh, stiffness of the vertebral bodies. Uh, and also perhaps um, a nutritional effect that the, uh, the nutrition to the disc uh, from the blood flow into the vertebral body is impeded by uh, having a chunk of cement sitting in there. Don't know, but I felt I, I felt I was seeing that. Uh, and then when we started talking, and actually I think it came through ISSG as an idea, uh, uh, talking about tethers, um, I started doing that initially using tethers to the um, UIV plus one rib, creating another incision, looping either a soft tether or even a metal claw around the rib and, and running an auxiliary rod down to the primary rod. That actually worked quite nicely for me, but it was, um, was a little bit 
cumbersome and time consuming in the OR. And so more recently, what I've done in PJF is, is a tether in the midline, uh, usually a figure of eight tether uh, just with a simple mersaline tape uh, uh, looped through the uh, uh, transverse hole in the UIV plus one and the UIV and then tied over a, a cross link and, and distracted to tension that up. The next generation of implants is going to have uh, a much easier ability, much easier implants to do this that'll, you know, dovetail into the primary metal implant and will allow some kind of a measurement of the tension. So that's a long answer to your question and, and, and not even a complete answer yet, but that technique, by the way, is up on YouTube and some of our other SSF videos. If anyone is unclear just from my extended verbiage, you can actually take a look and I think it'll be more apparent what I'm saying. I use the same technique now in DJF or in, in distal junction. So in a longer th uh, cervical thoracic construct that I'm worried about uh, distal breakdown, I will put a transverse hole in the uh, the uh, lowest instrumented vertebra and the lowest instrumented vertebra minus one and loop a tape and uh, and distract that and, and tether it uh, in the same way that I do it in uh, upper junction of a thoracolumbar construct. I'm interested, uh, Peter, what, what's your approach to that? So I agree. I think um, I think it's still some, something we're studying. Um, I think the biggest issue is predicting the risk of occurrence. Uh, so knowing uh, how high the risk is in uh, the presence of secondary uh, drivers of the deformity, recognition and in high risk patients, uh, including those in your constructs. I'd also say that um, a tethering uh, remains to be seen how effective it's going to be in, uh, for, for distal failure uh, because it's kind of the opposite in terms of uh, strain and pull out forces as it is in, in uh, thoracolumbar, you know, going from the t uh, bottom up to the top down. Um, but um, you know, I think um, I think uh, I've tried it as well. Um, I don't have a clear answer for you. I've also used distal kyphoplasty, but I think going long in patients with secondary drivers who are high risk mm -hmm. is the main issue. Where do you stop? Do you have a preferred level to stop? I think um, we can we can measure segmental uh, bone health uh, now with most uh, and most imaging centers. So that's something I do when I'm picking my uh, my uh, LIV. Um, but uh, if there is a significant lumbopelvic uh, malalignment, uh, sometimes I'll address that first before the cervical deformity, but more commonly it's located in the thoracic. So I think the main, the heart of that is going uh, below the thoracic apex mm -hmm. and coming up with a healthy level of bone to stop at. Right, right. Great. Well, thanks for all those qu comments. I think that really added to the content here.